Steve Bannon has been let go from the White House. Of course, Steve Bannon uh, was Trump's chief strategist, and he was the editor of Breitbart before that. Uh, he's now going back to Breitbart, which is pretty unexpected. I would have guessed that if at any time he left the White House, that's where he would end up. Um, but needless to say, this is another big move from Trump. I mean, everybody who's been in the administration is pretty much gone. You know, it's almost like, I forget which magazine is doing it, but they're treating it like it's a literal reality show, and like Survivor or something. And you have, you know, Scaramucci gone, Priebus gone, and you just go through the list. General Flynn from way back, he was one of the first ones that Trump got rid of, but he just keeps shuffling people around. Um, so, why was he fired? Well, uh, here's the speculation. Since officially leaving the White House role of chief strategist on Friday, Steve Bannon has raised a lot of eyebrows. Within hours of news breaking of his departure, it was announced that Bannon would be returning to his role in running what he described as an alt-right haven, Breitbart.com. The editors of Breitbart were reportedly thrilled with Bannon's return and very publicly called for war and going thermonuclear against the globalists behind Bannon's departure. After leaving the White House, Bannon has stirred the pot, notably saying that uh, the, quote, Trump presidency that we fought for and won is over, and reportedly said that he was gonna, going to go, excuse me, he was going to war for Trump against his opponents. The speculation is Ivanka and Jared um, were concerned about how their dad having Bannon so close to them, how that was going to make them look in the Jewish community. Because Bannon's ties to the alt-right make him questionable in terms of anti-Semitism. So one of the rumors, one of the, some of the speculation is that Ivanka and Jared were behind the firing of Steve Bannon, uh, and they pushed Trump to fire him because they were very concerned about how they would look. They're both uh, Jewish. In fact, I think um, Ivanka it converted to Orthodox Judaism. That's what Jared Kushner is, and Ivanka converted, and they don't like how Steve Bannon makes them look in the Jewish community. So they were concerned about that. They prodded Trump, and then Trump eventually said, okay, we're, we're going to get rid of him. So that may be one of the reasons he's gone. Possibly. But again, that's just speculation. So you don't know. And I think it's speculation birthed at Breitbart. So very questionable because they're a right wing outlet and they're known to make shit up from time to time. Um, but another reason would be an interview that Bannon gave not that long ago to the American Prospect. He was speaking to a uh, reporter at the American Prospect and he pulled a Scaramucci which is talking to a reporter and not knowing that he's actually being interviewed and that everything is being taken down on the record and being too ridiculous to throw out there like, hey, keep this off the record. He didn't know or he trusted the reporter or he didn't think he was being interviewed, so he thought he was having a conversation with the guy. And he said a lot of really revealing, interesting stuff. Uh, and Trump, this happened directly after that interview, so Trump likely read the interview and said, I don't like this. But what exactly did he not like? Well, let me tell you exactly what Bannon said in the interview, and then we'll break it down. So he said this, quote, Forget it. Until somebody... This is about North Korea. Forget it. Until somebody solves the part of the equation that shows me that 10 million people in Seoul don't die in the first 30 minutes from conventional weapons, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no military solution here. They got us. Wow, so that right there is undermining everything Trump's been saying on North Korea. How he's been, oh yeah, macho man, tough guy, look, maybe we do regime change. Maybe we do regime change and it'll be tremendous, believe me, let me just tell you. And Bannon's giving interviews, chief strategist going, come on, let's be serious, they got us. Because there's no scenario in which you don't have Seoul, people die, tremendous number of people die in Seoul. So... What, who are we kidding? We're not going to do intervention. That'd be crazy. So that could be one of the things Trump looks at and says, don't fucking undermine me. I'm out here, you know, doing my macho, bravado, tough guy stuff, and you're going to go there and say, of course, that's off the table, military intervention in North Korea. Don't do that. Don't do that. That could be one thing. Another thing is, and I think this one's probably more likely, he also said in the interview that 
China is at economic war with us, which is something Trump has said many times. Um, but he basically implies that, like, Trump's been soft uh, on China in terms of how to respond to the economic situation. And so Bannon said that he's getting hawks into position to basically do some sort of, you know, economic trade war or crack down on China. So that's the thing that I think probably irked Trump the most, is that when you have somebody who's your chief strategist and he acts like he's the big boy wearing the big boy pants saying, yeah, I'm getting hawks in here. I'm getting rid of all the people who aren't tough enough on China. I'm the one that's, you know, basically steering the ship here. I think big boss man Trump, who's secretly a man baby, not really that secret, but he thinks he's the man, but he's a man baby. He's, no, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge, Steve. And so when anybody overshadows him in terms of, you know, gets more press, acts like they're in charge, he's like, no, no, no. I'm the one that's in charge here, motherfucker. And then he acts. This is what happened with Scaramucci. Apparently with Scaramucci, Trump said he really hated that Scaramucci was getting all the limelight and getting all the press. And so he said, I'm going to let him go. So... That's likely the case. By the way, there were also other really interesting parts of that interview with Steve Bannon. I don't think these things were why he got let go, the other things that I'm about to tell you, but um, what I just outlined here might have something to do with it. And it could be a mix of all this. It could be Ivanka and Jared pushing Trump along with this stuff as well. But uh, Bannon called the alt-right, which really is his base and Trump's base, uh, called them... A a collection of clowns. And he said, uh, ethno-nationalism is stupid. Which is really shocking, by the way, because this is a guy who's pandered as much as humanly possible to that idea, and even himself has cited, uh, I forget the name of the book, but Camp of the Saints, something of the Saints, where, like, the, the solution in the book is, like, we need a white ethno-state. So he acted, he said, like, this is a brilliant book and all that stuff. And he was the one who told Donald Trump, like, I don't even, we don't even really want high skilled immigrants here because, you know, a lot of high skilled immigrants come from India, for example. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, we're also creating a civilization here. And there's really the work skills, the only thing that matter. So Trump was even saying, okay, let's have high skilled immigrants. This is going back a while um, before Bannon was working for Trump, as when Bannon was doing a radio show for Breitbart. And uh, Bannon was like, I don't even know about that. So Bannon himself has made kind of clear that he favors a white ethno state. So for him to say in this interview, I think it, it's stupid and I think, the, the you know, it's a fringe element and it's a bunch of clowns. That's really interesting. And then another point he made, which I think is actually true, is he said, man, I'd love it if the Democrats kept talking about identity politics because then us Republicans will keep winning from now until forever. So in other words, he's like, go ahead, go, go ahead, go down your path, go down your road of, you know, doing nothing but talking about identity politics on the left, and then we'll destroy you. Because, you know, to defend gay people and defend black people and to defend women and to only talk about those issues, uh, Bannon says, well, you're leaving the door open for us to talk about economic nationalism all day long. And that's going to appeal, appeal to a much wider audience than when you're talking about identity politics. So please, I'd love it if the Democrats kept talking about identity politics. And on that, he actually has a point. I mean, and that's not saying the Democrats shouldn't protect minorities who are vulnerable. Of course we should. There's no question about that. But it's it's saying don't, if the Democrats do that to the exclusion of talking about economic populism, well, then they're going to get their asses handed to them by the Republicans. So, and Bannon knows that, and Bannon was talking about that. He was making that point. So he said a bunch of interesting things in the interview. Now... The final point in the conversation about Bannon being gone now is the effects of it. So the upsides of Bannon being gone, at least to this point, because I think the bulk of the evidence shows that he's an odious force on social issues. So like when it comes to race issues and when it comes to um, social issues, having Bannon gone is a giant upside. Giant upside. Because again, the bulk of the evidence shows that Bannon is really bad on those kinds of issues. Kind of, it, he was super sympathetic to, you know, white nationalism. This interview is the first interview I've ever seen where he kind of, you know, expresses the opposite sentiment. But I think overall, it's good that he's gone for those issues. However, 
it has to be said because it's just factual about what Bannon believes and what he's pushed for behind the scenes. When it comes to economic issues and foreign policy issues, it actually is not the best thing in the world that Bannon's gone. Because on those issues, he was the only, yes, left-leaning voice. So on foreign policy, big-time non-interventionist. Big-time non-interventionist. Every time there was something that came up wh where the question was more intervention or less intervention, Bannon would say, L do less. Do less. Because he's an old-school Pat Buchanan-style Republican. So uh, what that means is he's not, he's not a neoconservative. He's a paleoconservative. Which means, yes, let's not spend all of our money on foreign policy adventures and, you know, massacre, massacring people overseas. We got enough problems here to deal with. I don't give a fuck about what's going on over there. So he was pushing against intervention when it comes to North Korea. He was pushing against intervention when it comes to Syria. He was pushing against inf intervention when it comes to Afghanistan. Uh, and he may be the only voice in the administration that was doing that. So... That presents a little bit of a conundrum here, a pickle here, where the net effects on certain issues will be negative that Bannon has gone on economic populism. Now, Trump spoke a lot about, oh, you, you know, NAFTA, bad, sad, terrible, lost a lot of good American uh, jobs. He said that, but his actions haven't proved out that he really believes that, and he really is against uh, so-called free trade and for protectionism. I mean, he outsources his own jobs all over the place, so Trump's just a hypocrite and he's all over the place on this stuff. Um, and his policies have been the opposite. So, oh, he scrapped TPP, but then he's bringing back provisions of TPP in the new NAFTA renegotiation that they're doing. So it was a ruse with Trump. Now, Bannon, I think, has been fairly consistent. And I think he actually believes that these free trade deals are a bad idea. And so Bannon, behind the scenes, was a force against... Uh, Steve Mnuchin, Gary Cohn, Wall Street bankers who are pushing Trump behind the scenes to try to outsource more jobs and do more shitty trade deals. And so I think Bannon actually believes in a lot of the economic populist stuff, economic nationalist stuff. Now, he might not believe in it for the right reasons. It's not like he's believing in it because he cares so much about the American worker. He believes in it because he doesn't like, you know, people in fucking... Bangladesh and Turkey, and he wants, you know, the American middle class to get the jobs. So there's like a tinge of race politics underlying why Bannon has the right position. But on this, he's actually correct that we should care more about Americans getting jobs than having giant multinational corporations that are super profitable shipping all the jobs overseas so they can make an extra buck. He's wrong because he wants it to go to the white working class and not, you know, Everybody who's American, black, brown, white, whatever. Uh, but he's right on the overall picture that on economics, we, should, we shouldn't do as many so-called free trade deals, which are really just outsourcing deals. And we should craft policy to be good for the middle class. So on economic issues and on foreign policy issues, it's just true that Bannon is a lot better than anybody else in the White House. And now with him gone... Well, I mean, come on, who's running the show completely now? Wall Street's running the show completely. When it comes to foreign policy, neocons and generals are running the show completely. And then outside of that, anybody else Trump likes is basically a scam artist. Somebody like him who doesn't know anything but just kind of rises their personality to the top. So the other interesting part is what's going to happen in terms of how Breitbart reacts? Because like I said, some writers at Breitbart were like, hashtag war the second this happened. And Bannon himself was like, yeah, we're going to attack Trump's enemies. He said that. But then, like I mentioned for you, he also said, oh, the Trump White House we fought for is done. It's gone. So, holy shnikes, man. Look at this situation that we're in right now. This is wild. This is wild. So Breitbart might start going after Trump. Um, and we might... Another point people made is Bannon had, like, top security clearance, so now he knows a lot of shit, and people are saying, oh, uh-oh, are we gonna have, like, illegal leaks here or whatever? I don't care as much about that. I mean, it's not like Bannon's gonna leak the nuclear launch codes, so chances are whatever he's gonna tell us 
are going to be things that we should know in a democracy because they always the government always abuses classified information and top secret information. Anything that they think is slightly embarrassing to them, they're like, hey, yeah, well, you can't see this, American public, for national security reasons, of course, national security. Never has almost anything to do with national security. Um, so this is going to be interesting from here on out. Uh, but Steve Bannon is out. And this is also the day after there was like a hashtag fire Bannon or a few days after there was a hashtag fire Bannon thing going on. Because in the wake of um, what happened in Charlottesville, it's pretty clear and it's a matter of record that Seb Gorka and Steve Bannon on race issues are probably the worst in the White House. Like they're they're the ones that have the the longest history of making racist comments. And so one of the reactions from people on the left in the country to the situation in Charlottesville is fire Bannon and fire Gorka because they're inexcusable on those issues. And the fact that they're still in your administration shows that Trump harbors some level of sympathy towards this white nationalist movement. So <laughs> they got what they wished for, that's for sure. But that might have some downsides on economic policy and on foreign policy. So, man, a White House in disarray is the only way to describe what's going on right now.